Hello everybody, welcome to Oscar Rossi Bucket. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't already and drop a like on this video. I am trying to hit 100k subscribers on the channel by the end of the year, so your subscription will be much appreciated. Also drop a like on this video, it only takes one second and makes a massive difference. So in today's post-game recap from a couple of days ago for this week that are pre-recorded, I am talking about the Bulls versus Sixers game that happened on Wednesday. Uh, this game I watched a couple of days ago. I'm recording this on Saturday. Uh, but I wanted to not talk about the Bulls too much. I'm actually going to talk about the Philadelphia 76ers. Uh, I don't want to oversaturate the Bulls talk too much because uh, I know it's very easy for me to go on a long ramble about them. And I understand that some of you guys enjoy that when I do it, especially on the negative end of things. But I don't want to oversaturate my channel with just one team. So with that said, I will go over some cliff notes for this game. Uh, Zach Levine kind of blew that game in the fourth quarter. It was really his fault as like the momentum was swinging in the Bulls' favor. And then he came in and decided to play hero ball. Had some tunnel vision. Had some bad shots. Not a great look. And honestly, if Zach just didn't even play in that fourth quarter... They might have actually won the game, which is not good to say. It doesn't feel good to say, but it's the truth of the situation. Um, I'll give him this injury on his thumb or whatever. Uh, jump shot has not looked the same since that injury, but once that gets back, I'm sure he'll be fine. DeMar DeRozan, 37 and 10 on 60% shooting. I mean, what the fuck else can I say? The guy has been playing at like an MVP level for this team. And he's been easily the best player in the team so far this season. I'm hoping that does not persist because it's gonna be bad for my Zach Levine narrative, but DeRozan, very good. Uh, outside of that, Lonzo, uh, kind of a weird game from him. He had a lot of turnovers and some weirdly bad defensive plays, especially against Seth Curry, but we'll talk about Seth in a second. Um, and then outside of that, not a whole lot of contributions from the bench and, oh, <coughs> I forgot. Vucevic was terrible, and he wasn't getting touches, but then even when he was, he was fucking blowing them, and he was passing up shots. Uh, defensively, played really good straight up on Joel Embiid. Uh, and I will say, I was watching Kenny's post-game recap. He was talking about Vucevic's defense. Uh, Kenny, I would implore you to pay attention to Vucevic's defense in terms of defending the pick and roll, and more importantly, how he will step up and defend the the role or the guard and defend the role man on a recovery and often play the passing lane from that you'll notice Vucevic getting past the steals all the time that way I Vucevic has one of the best defensive ratings in the league right now which I think is more a product of the system than Vucevic's actual defensive capabilities but people acting like Vucevic is a terrible defender it's just objectively untrue uh on philly's end of things though and that's what we're going to be talking about for the majority of this video uh joel and had a pretty fucking awful scoring game he was six for 18 like i said vucevic played him well straight up he also just missed some jump shots that he would usually make um seth curry unbelievable in this one 22 points he hit the dagger mid-range shot that was um I was just about to explain what a dagger is. It's the shot that made it so it was clear they were going to win. The Bulls got it to be a two-point game with like 30 seconds left. Philly had the ball. It was imperative they got a stop. And then Lonzo got burned on a on a Seth uh, mid-range pull-up. Seth is now up to 18 points per game on the season with the Sixers being uh, the highest ranked team in the Eastern Conference, if I'm not mistaken. Yes. They are 7-2, and two, and that has come off of the backs of Steph stepping up, averaging 20 a game. Embiid, Embiid's offense has been weird. His scoring numbers are down, his assists are up, and his defense is the best it's ever been. Uh, he seems to have, it almost seems like his defensive impact stands out more when Ben Simmons is not there. And we're going to talk about Ben and the lack of him on this roster in a second here. But, uh... Embiid has been more of a playmaker as it's just like him getting doubled and passing it out to shooters and stuff like that or not even being strictly doubled but just bringing some deten attention and being able to make the pass to a guy who's maybe not necessarily going to be open but will find somebody who's open. Uh, just interesting that this has been an aspect of Embiid's game that's been unlocked. I mean that's semi to be expected. Embiid plus shooters of course is going to be passing it out more uh, and honestly if I'm not mistaken, I'm actually going to check this on Basketball Reference just to be sure. I saw a tweet that suggested this, so let me just let me just clarify. I believe the Sixers are the best uh, offense in the NBA. 
yeah, they are the number one offense in the league, and they are number 14 in defense. So, uh, with Ben Simmons off of the floor, the best the Sixers offense has ever looked, in spite of the fact that Joel Embiid's scoring numbers are down. And that is because the system cultivated around Embiid really just plays to his strengths and plays more to modern basketball, ironically, where taking a big guard off of the floor is worse for modern or is better for changing it to modern basketball than a more traditional big man but it's the shooting from you know cork Maz, seth uh tyrese maxi not the greatest three-point shooter in the world and let me actually pull up his stats just because i'm curious what he's shooting on the season um he is taking 2.63s a game and he is shooting 35 percent but he is playmaking really well and driving really well but uh, as mentioned, uh, what was I saying? Oh yeah, the shooting. Also, Georges Niang, who has turned out to be a bigger addition to this team than previously thought, as he is currently averaging 12 points per game off the bench and shooting 42% from three on six attempts a game, playing 22 minutes per game. In this game, he had 18 points, hit four three-pointers. A lot of those three-pointers were contested and really pissed me off because uh, I was like, we're playing good defense and this guy's fucking making the shot regardless. Uh, but yeah, all the shooting. Matisse Seibel uh, actually hit two three-pointers in this one out on three attempts, so there's that. But you know, typically not going to be much of a three-point shooter. Let me let me check his stats. Yeah, he's 31%. That, that sounds about right. Um, Tobias Harris is not playing this game. He's, of course, going to be an offensive threat normally. Uh, didn't he's averaging 20 right now, but didn't play this game. But like the breakout of Seth, uh, the 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 great play from Tyrese Max. I mean, 15 points per game in your second year. I honestly think Tyrese will get to like 18 as the year continues because his drive game is like really good. As I mentioned, this is a bad, not great game from Lonzo. It was the turnovers, and then defensively, he got burned like a lot. It was Tyrese specifically with his speed uh, coming out of the pick and roll or just straight up blowing by him like a lot of drives where Lonzo just kind of fell asleep at the wheel and Tyrese took advantage uh really quick good at getting you know I, I don't know how to like good at body control uh if he has a defender in the paint that he just has to wrap his body around in order to get the finish that's a weird sentence. He, he can do it. Uh, so Tyrese's offense, Seth Curry's offense, all this stuff has been unlocked by Ben Simmons just not being on the floor. And there's a trade-off. The Sixers are now the best offense in the league. However, as I mentioned, 14th in defense, which is definitely, well, I mean, I actually think they were somewhere near there last year. Not last year. There was some, there was some year where their defense was... Am I am I thinking am I crazy? I could have swore there was year they were like 13th for no reason. Okay, the 2018-19 season, which I believe is Ben Simmons. I guess that's Ben's rookie year. Or no, that's that's the year with Jimmy Butler. Yeah, it was that's what I was like, yeah, there was a year where they were like weirdly not as good on defense as they should have been. But uh not recent years, so I got that messed up. <coughs> <coughs> But I honestly think the little bit of a dip defensively, which, you know, it's not nothing defensively to go from uh, the second best defense to the 14th. But I also think to go from the uh, 13th offense to the first, I mean, you could argue there's not a huge difference there in terms of like um, how good the team is. You're just trading offense for defense and you want to argue what's valued more. But I'll just say it feels like their capacity to win a game is better now than it was before. Their net rating is currently plus 8.8 .8 as a team when last year was plus 5.6. And they were the first seed last year. So their net rating is even better as the first seed this year. So, I don't know. Everything that seems more natural... I understand the defensive drop off, but offensively, it's just so much more relaxed and so much better, so much more form fitting. And it just seems like basketball, the way it's meant to be played. And and honestly, if you can just get not even a star, just like a really good starter or a borderline star caliber player for Ben Simmons, honestly, I think that's the move to go with all the drama that's going on around him, even though I know you're going to be a worse defensive team. If you can just put like a good star caliber player, not even as good as Ben Simmons, but like even like a Malcolm Brogdon, I mean, you want to argue what qualifies a star, but like even a Malcolm Brogdon caliber player and like another role player thrown in there, honestly, 
The Sixers team is already really good. You're just going to get better with that. I would do it because it feels like that's it's, it, this is not going to happen. Ben on the Sixers again, not going to happen. Their offense is better without him, and their defense is worse, but honestly, this feels like a better team. I, I, I can't make a huge justification like, oh, yeah, it's clearly better when like the defense has also fallen off, and that's a byproduct of no more Ben Simmons, but it really just feels like this is a different team and a better team. Uh, and to think that while this is happening, Joel Embiid is struggling with his shot. So Joel Embiid is averaging just under 20 points per game right now. Even his rebounding is down, which is weird. Uh, and then he's shooting 41% from the field and 32% from three. Their best player, their biggest scoring threat, really not efficient right now. Really not the producing the amount of points that you would want for him to do right now. And he and, and the Sixers are the number one def offense in the league. That's pretty fucking nuts. The, the the equation of just remove Ben Simmons's shooting weakness, and then suddenly here you get best offense in the league. Yeah, not looking good for the case of keeping Ben Simmons around. But yeah, that is it. Goodbye.